Hello, this is Todd Lewis, the host of the Praise of Folly podcast. This is episode two on scientism, and I am again accompanied with my colleague Brock Bellarive. And we're here to talk about the nature of scientism. Now, scientism is a description, it's a certain outlook on science itself, which amounts more to a religion. And I almost think a better word for it is futurism, and we can get into that a little bit later, but the broad outlines of scientism as I see it are this. The idea that science progresses naturally and necessarily, in fact, any impediment to the, pro to the progress of science is itself an evil. It's actually evil to hinder the progress of science. And science itself is this sort of like self-critiquing, truth-seeking mechanism that can transcend the petty disputes of individuals that do the science and will ultimately lead to the salvation of mankind. Uh, we've seen such rhetoric with people like uh, Turgot and Condorcet in the 18th century. We've seen such rhetoric from people like H.G. Wells in the 19th century, or the 20th century, well, 19th and 20th century. And then we've seen such rhetoric with people like Ray Kurzweil in the 19th, the 20th and 21st century. And, and really, this, this, this narrative is, is based on a certain set of values. The idea that science itself is a good in and of itself. And one of the things that we'll notice in the modern age is people might say religion or politics or economics, or corporations are corrupt. But there's this long-standing uh, respect and veneration of scientific institutions. The most cynical person will still have uh, cynical in the sense that he's cynical of politics, corporations, or religions, will still have a very deep faith in the scientific process. That it's pure, that it's true, and that it will ultimately lead to the salvation of mankind. A rather nonsensical and silly notion. But uh, do you have anything to add on the definition of scientism, Brock? Yeah, actually I, I do. Uh I think the uh, philosophical underpinning of scientism, and I think you'll agree, is uh, metaphysical naturalism. And I guess we could say what that is. We could quote Carl Sagan. He said that the material universe is all there ever was, all there is, and all there ever will be. What does that mean? It means that the ultimate reality is the physical reality that we see. There is There is no reality beyond beyond the world that we, we experience. And especially beyond the world, there's no reality beyond the world that we can test. So interestingly enough, while this seems to encompass quite a great deal of our experience, the scientific method does impact us on a daily basis, it does seem to neglect a vast otherworldly body of human experience that does not deal with the physical world. And I think we'll get into that later because that's going to be one of our primary objections against the uh, scientists, uh, scientific claim that the scientific method is the only means by which we can come to truth. And I think if, I think if we wanted to really sum it up in a short pithy statement, we would say that the scientific method is the only way to come at truth. Well, exactly. I think that's a fair description. Someone like a Richard Dawkins or a, uh, a Lawrence Krauss or a Christopher Hitchens would have said the same thing. I think also what needs to be said is what distinguishes science from scientism. Science itself is a methodology and a process invented by Francis Bacon in the, uh, I think it was the 16th century when he developed the scientific method of observation. Now, there were certain medieval antecedents uh, which we can speak of. There was Roger Bacon and others who, before him, uh, laid certain conceptual frame foundations for the later Francis. But um, modern so science uh, as such is just a method of observing the physical world. It says nothing about uh, metaphysical existence or historical, fa uh, historical events. Uh, scientism claims to give an account of everything, the origin of the universe, the historical origin of everything, uh, the meaning of life, the end of the universe. Everything that we would classically ascribe to a religion, such as Christianity or Buddhism. Well, exactly. The, the, it does seek to answer the same questions. And uh, 
what I'll bring up later is that it actually answers these questions in very much the same way that a lot of the ancient Greek philosophers tried to answer those questions. So in some way, the, their efforts at a cosmogony, at a cosmology, are all reminiscent of earlier Greek efforts to encapsulate the cause of man and the cause of the universe from which he exists. So it does attempt to answer theological questions. And this is where I believe it tends to get into trouble. Because when we start talking about the Big Bang Theory, when we start talking about the theory of evolution, these are unobservables. And they might argue to the contrary, but the absolute fact of the matter is there's no way we can prove via the scientific method the validity of the Big Bang Theory or the theory of evolution. So what, when, when I guess what I would say is scientism is different than science in that scientism attempts to actually go beyond what science is capable of proving. I guess we could actually add that. That seems to be uh, a fundamental feature of scientism, that uh, anything said by a scientist is therefore scientific. Well, that's just simply not true. Well, exactly. Exactly. Um, your point, and we can get into this later, about the um, ancient pagan beliefs about the origin of the universe as being recapitulated in modern science is a position actually held by the Vatican Observatory uh, affiliate, uh, Guy Consolmagno. Mm -hmm. And he had a, he had a very interesting uh, podcast series, which is the top of my mind, I can't think of at the moment, where he describes the basic pagan accounts of the origin and death of the universe and finds correlations with modern scientific theories. Which would tend to indicate that they're just rehashing ancient pagan ideas. In fact, I do remember when I used to watch television, I was watching the Science Channel, and Michio Kaku said that the uh, Viking uh, end of the universe uh, notion of Ragnarok was more likely to be true. And he, of course, he was using that, uh, to tie, tying that up with a big crunch. And so, you know, again, they, they can't help but use these, these pre Christian pagan uh, beliefs and metaphors to describe their view of the universe, which is was really just a, a pagan view anyhow. But I think scientism, you made a good point. Scientism is trying to say more using the scientific method than they're actually able to. The scientific method is limited to repeatable observations in a laboratory. And last I checked, big bangs are not repeatable observations in a laboratory. And last I checked, abiogenesis are not repeatable experiments you can observe in a laboratory. Now, when you limit yourself to that criteria, that narrow criteria given by Bacon, no foul, no harm, no foul, everything's fine. But scientism tries to, because, it's, because science is so powerful in its specific realm, they decide to take it elsewhere. And of course, one of the odd, odd realities of scientism is that it actually leads to irrationality. I've heard Michio Kaku say that on the subatomic level, if you fire a particle, you can hit three targets in different spatial locations at once, which is, oh, God, it's absurd. If I fire a bullet at a plate, I'm not going to hit three plates. I'm going to hit one plate. Um, and because of uh, quantum mechanics, uh, 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 a, a new atheist philosopher named Enquivis in his debate with William Lane Craig had the audacity to argue that the law of the excluded middle does not exist in nature. And of course, everybody should be familiar with the laughable moment where Lawrence Krauss's t-shirt said, two plus two equals five for very large values of two. All I can say is Krauss must have never heard of the law of identity. Oh, absolutely. I mean, because, I mean, that was a really frustrating moment in that debate with William Lane Craig, because uh, Krauss has, is, Dr. Lawrence Krauss has definitely shown himself capable of making serious errors of judgment about the nature of physics. Uh, I believe he wrote the book, A, uh, A Universe from Nothing. I think you, you're familiar with it. And uh, I remember on the New York Times, uh, David Albert, a philosopher of science, basically tore the book apart. 
not only did he claim that it was a bait and switch, but he also claimed it was a complete fundamental misunderstanding, misunderstanding of quantum field theory. And so I'm always very skeptical when somebody tries to tell me how to interpret the, the statistical evaluation of the quantum realm. Uh, like, I tend to be more of an operationalist with respect to that. I don't know what's happening down there. None of us really do. We offer sort of analyses of what's happening down there. We might even offer theories. But the ultimate problem is, is we are so far removed from those features that to even begin speculating on how they are synced together, it really doesn't work as science. Quantum mechanics works. Yeah, I'll, I will concede that. But Quantum mechanics as a theory is a statistical theory. It doesn't pretend to know exactly what's going on down there. So anyone who attempts to uh, speculate on either things too large, too small, or too deep into the past, fundamentally uh, veer off of the path that science would allow it to follow. Well, exactly. And in many cases, when they interpret quantum data, they interpret it through a philosophical presupposition of naturalism, exactly. atheism, and humanism. None of which can be verified scientifically, but they hold to be true anyhow, which leads to a certain set of conclusions which are not demanded by the actual observable evidence or inferred evidence. And um, yeah, the, the, the article that you mentioned where um, Alpert just deconstructs Krauss, it, it really is laughable how Krauss can get away with what he does. But in many ways, Krauss is an example of what I call the magic science man syndrome, where you have a man in a white lab coat. He's the magic science man. He came off Mount Sinai with the word of the gospel, just like Zarathustra. And he says that this is truth. And in many ways, the modern scientific establishment mirrors the Roman Catholic Church of the Middle Ages. If the bishop or the pope told you to believe it, you shut up and believed it. Well, today, much the same way, magic science man wearing his white lab coat can tell you the same thing. And as far as an alternate religion and answering the same questions, if you ever watched uh, Ben Stein's Expelled, Richard Dawkins says, Christianity and science try to answer the same questions, and Christianity gets the wrong answer. Well, that's telling me that Richard Dawkins is having his own religion, and he just thinks his religion is the right one, no different than a Muslim or a Hindu or a Jew who thinks they have their right religion. Precisely, because uh, while they while these people tend they claim to subscribe to metaphysical naturalism, they simply cannot because they are always constantly making appeals to extra scientific uh, thought. Um, I I think uh, you're familiar with. Uh, David Hume's uh, an inquiry concerning human understanding and in it it was actually a very ironic statement a lot of us are familiar with it he said if we take in our hand any volume of divinity or school of metaphysics for instance let us ask does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number no does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence no Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. Well, the irony of that statement is, is that statement cannot be quantified and cannot be experimented upon. So it should be committed to the flames. In order for that statement to be valid, you must you must appeal to something metaphysical, because if we because the, what we are surrounded by so often as human beings, and as I had mentioned before, while the material world is a lot of our experience, a huge sum of our experience is completely metaphysical, that of language, that of thought, that of mathematics, that of logic, and none of those things can descend within the realm into the realm of science because it cannot be taken to the scientific method. Quantization just doesn't really work there. Experimentation doesn't work there. So what we must conclude then is either A, all of our thought is unprovable and probably false. Well, and, and, and consequently, 
the physical world is the only realm of truth. Well, that prov that provides a problem, because if if we cannot demonstrate the truth of what we say, of what we think, of how we understand, because it's not scientific, then how can we make any demonstration of scientific fact, which must always be done in terms of mathematics, logic, and language? So we either a have to reject that there are other realms of truth in accordance with scientism, which ironically destroys scientism itself as a doctrine, or B, we must concede that there is a massive realm of non-scientific data that contains truth that can be demonstrated beyond the scientific method. You're right. I mean, we could think of like axiology, the study of ethics. We could think of the study of aesthetics, of beauty. But um, one interesting subject to deal with here is the sort of historical narrative that this fairy tale of scientism has constructed for itself. And the, the general contours of this historical narrative are this. There was the big bad dark ages brought upon by the medieval Christian church. And led by plucky individuals of the likes of Galileo, men stood up for the truth. And they decided that they would fight against the corruption and lies and superstition of the church and speak truth and discover the nature of the universe and rediscover the ancient pagan scientific method, which of course is completely baloney and maybe for another podcast. But the next step is then that these well-intentioned humanitarian selfless saintly individuals decided to sacrifice all that they had for the pursuit of knowledge and truth and this ever upward progressive pyramid of knowledge for the betterment of all mankind. And at some glorious point in the future, much like Marx's classist utopia, we will have a future produced by science where there will be no class envy or racial hatred or ethnic hatred or uh, gender envy and religion will be abolished and we'll have this wonderful secular technocratic utopia. Now, that on the face of it is patently absurd. Um, one of the things that comes to mind is what was the what was the change of mind that led to the modern scientific method? Well, it's it's again Machiavelli, and I will not repeat my story of the mandrakes. I mentioned that in my previous podcast, but needless to say, the leading Machiavelli scholar Harvey Mansfield, in an interview with uh, I think it was a uh, Bill Crystal yep. argued that the modern age was the result of Machiavelli's refocusing of the moral to the practical, and such such a such a transition, such a rephrasing of the issues, is in fact endorsed by Sir Francis Bacon himself in his 1605, The Advancement of Learning. So Francis Bacon himself identifies the birth of the scientific outlook in Machiavelli's pragmatism over morality. You know, again, we, this has been mentioned previously in an earlier podcast, and I leave the viewer to watch that instead. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Machiavelli really does change the focus from the ancient tendency to... Uh, appreciate the idealized system and then pursue it and rather Machiavelli turns it on his head and says let's treat man as he is and create systems of government in accordance with man as he is it's a very uh, important step away from the ancients in that it moved towards pragmatism pragmatism over idealism and I mean idealism of course in uh, in the ancient sense definitely not in the, the modern sense yeah, not the Hegelian sense. Right. Um, but scientific utopianism was not long in the coming. You had you had Francis Bacon's The New Atlantis, a kind of lost scientific utopia, which some speculate might have been a template for the United States. In fact, there is a postage stamp, I think, from New England, which has Bacon on it called The New Atlantis. But speculation aside, we also have um, later on in the uh, late... 18th, early 19th century, people like Turgot and Condorcet. Turgot was more of a religious advocate, and Condorcet was more of an atheist. And in, in many ways, um, the scientific utopianism of Turgot is manifested in today's George Gilder, who is a strong Christian believer, but also a scientific utopian. 
And the more secular utopianism of Condorcet is expressed in people like Ray Kurzweil. And, but the point is this, the scientific the gospel of scientism, the abolition of poverty, the abolition of race and gender hatred, the abolition of religious strife, never happened. It is a complete farce. The fact that such, now in the, eight, in the 18th century, before the modern scientific method was applied to the extent that it is now, such fairy tales and delusions might have been excusable, but after the bloody horror of the 20th century, only a madman or someone, of, someone who's insane or of a dubious uh, mental faculties could still hold to such a view today. As even today, we can look at places like North Korea and China, both secular scientific countries that are complete hell holes that no rational human being would want to live in. And we shouldn't really be surprised because one of the realms that's completely excluded by scientism is that of the moral realm. It's because there is no moral it, there is no scientific answer to the moral question. Morality is another one of those things that is best applied to a non-materialistic metaphysics. And so science, because science actually, the science, uh, the scient the scientific interpretation of the human uh, struggle is about resource scarcity. So what needs to be remedied? Well, just scarcity itself. And Marx really took this to the absolute extreme because he wanted to abolish all forms of scarcity. And that even means the scarcity of women. Uh, because that, which, which means we have to abandon these social mores, right? So all forms of scarcity must be abandoned or destroyed, whether they're created by m morality or they're created by a sort of natural scarcity. These must be destroyed so as to create a harmonious society. The problem is uh, they, these people don't really have an account of human evil. They don't really have an account of, uh, say, a fall of man that, that Christianity has, where the problem is treated as a spiritual problem, not just a problem of resource scarcity. And we have seen in the last 200 years, abundance in the West, abundance untold. And yet, as you had mentioned, the 20th century is the bloodiest century in human history. And it wasn't just because populations were higher, because the per capita murder of the people in uh, the Soviet Union and in China and uh, in Cambodia was outstandingly over the top even compared to the actions of Genghis Khan. I mean, wasn't it uh, in Cambodia, was it Pol Pot annihilated like a third of his population? Yeah, exactly. That's astounding. Exactly. And, and so there, the, it, because it fails to answer the moral question, because it fails to answer what is wrong with humanity, because it's wrong about s scarcity is the cause of evil, it, we have not seen the, the, the technocratic utopia that they have promised. Well, exactly. In fact, you mentioned that Marxism was a logical extension of the uh, scientific process. And, and, and such a claim is made by Richard Pipes in, I forget if it's either his Russian Revolution or Russia under the Bolshevik regime, but those are his seminal works on the account of the origin of communist Russia. And in there, to paraphrase Pipes, he says the Enlightenment was the greatest disaster to beset mankind because it created the myth of the tabula rasa, the infinitely malleable man, that the scientific elites could then use to, to, to mold us, to justify their attempts to mold us into their own likeness. But there's, there's a thing that needs to be pointed out here. What fuels scientific development? It's generally the case, almost always the case, that scientific development is funded by the state. Now, why is that the case? Do they do it out of their own goodness of their heart? No, they do it because they want weapons. And the history of scientific development from the time of Roger Bacon, Francis Bacon to today is that of increasing state power in accordance with the reach of technology itself. In fact, the notion that scientific power, uh, in uh, uh, the, the development of scientific power allows states to control their population 
is in fact something that's actually believed, stated specifically by Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell argued that the only way that the technology would allow democratic regimes to have the same amount of control over their own population heretofore only achieved in totalitarian regimes. And that is really outstanding because what it's telling you is that the form of government you have is irrelevant. The form of government doesn't really matter in the backdrop of science because in the backdrop of science, even a democracy can have totalitarian control. Yeah, well, of course, we, we've actually seen that this happening because what science, what is science, what is the, what does technology really do? It advances man's control over nature and his fellow man. That is, that is the essential component therein. When we look, you, you mentioned that uh, the state has uh, definitely benefited the progress of science. Well, yeah, that's absolutely obvious. I mean, some of the most common examples we could give is like, uh, well, I mean, in a general, generic sense, you know, we have margarine because of that. We have uh, nylon because of that. We have satellites because of that. We have uh, nuclear energy because of that. We have computers because of that. We have internet because of that. So, yes, the state is always advancing science, but to what end? Uh, we could ascribe beneficent qualities to the state and say, well, they're just out to better our lives. But that just doesn't seem to be the case, especially when we look at the Cold War. The Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States was characterized by a technological arms race. Why? Because it was about power. It was about exerting hegemony over the world. So this goes back to the Faustian bargain, right? Uh, we, we have gained the world but lost our soul in the process. We have gained this massive amount of knowledge and power over the world, but we lost ourselves in the process. So science, the, the technology itself is not a bad thing, but we must always understand why it is being developed along the course that it is. And it is plainly evident that the state is very much, much, much more interested in its control of nature and man than for the benefit of nature and man. Well, exactly, exactly. Um, there's an inter now, as we mentioned in our previous podcast, correlation does not imply causation. But there's a very interesting correlation that you can see beginning at least in 1851. In 1851, there was the world. Uh, the World's Fair in London with the Crystal Palace, which was a glorification of science. Science will save us. Here is the glorious center of the British Empire and the saving grace of science. But 10 years later, we have the blood and death of the American Civil War, where sadly over half a million Americans died. And then we had the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893 or 94. And 20 years, again, celebrating the great savior of science. But 20 years later, we had the blood and death of trenches, machine guns, poison gas, and high explosive artillery. And in the 1920s and 30s, we had science fiction authors of the likes of H.G. Wells, who again, praise the gospel of science. And that ended with the atomic bomb over Hiroshima and the death camps in Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. And there's an interesting correlation that whenever there's a rise in scientific utopianism, there is seemingly a backlash where that science is used to commit mass murder and genocide on a scale heretofore unimaginable. And this current utopianism, led by the likes of, again, Ray Kurzweil, makes me wonder, are we waiting for another swing of the pendulum to disabuse us of such foolish notions? One could only hope. We we need to understand that science is a tool. Science is a tool. It's a way of dealing with the world, much like a hammer or a hacksaw. It is a tool to accomplish an end. But just as a hacksaw can be used to cut wood or cut up a dead body you're trying to hide from the police, so too can science function as that double-edged double -edged sword. So this idea that science could ever save us from our moral conundrum is complete hogwash. It's complete fairy tale because science isn't that kind of thing. It is not a moral weapon. It is not a moral decider. It is a tool. And the tool, a tool 
makes all the difference depending on what kind of man is wielding it. If you have a, I mean, sure, technology has obviously boosted our standard of living, but that does not render the tool a moral tool. It's just a tool. We can't ascribe a moral property to the tool. What I do with the tool makes the difference. If I choose to use the tool to benefit my fellow man, then that action can be described as morally righteous. But if I choose to use that tool in order to acquire domination over nature and man, then I would ascribe to that a morally wicked property. But the scientist isn't even in the scientific community is not even really in a position to talk about good and evil because we sh we really shouldn't be surprised that we saw the bloodbath that we did in the 20th century. Why? Well, because, I mean, if we're all just evolved from ape, our ape uh, ancestors and all of our ancestors actually go back to the primordial stew that was at the beginning of uh, life on earth and if all of earth itself came from nothing as the likes of Lawrence Krauss like to put put it then what does difference does it make what is the real what is what is what puts human beings on such an important scale that suddenly morality would enter the picture it doesn't because there's no there's no point in the evolutionary scheme that they have offered us and have shoved down our throats that suggests morality should play a role in our existence whatsoever there is no rape in the animal kingdom there is no murder in the animal kingdom. We don't offer moral condemnation and outrage at the activities of animals. So why suddenly suggest that morality pops into existence just because the uh, human being pops into the uh, scene? It just doesn't follow. There's no reason to believe there's morality. Well, exactly. And you see, th this kind of insane utopian cult uh, of science it doesn't understand where it's going uh jfc fuller in his account of the second world war writes this on page 411 of the second world war 1939 to 45 a history a tactical and strategic history he writes that this is not war it is the conflict of gangsters and by that he responds to using atomic bombs as we know them today, armies, navies, and air forces have no place in such a struggle. And even should the atomic bomb not be used, because it may be fighting forces will have to be redesigned to meet this possibility. Therefore, it would seem that in any case, each service will have to be redesigned, and the subsequent, in consequence, each will have to be duplicated for war with atomic bombs. This makes the problem of war still more absurd. Nevertheless, absurdity does not alter the fact that in an age which has lost all trust in spiritual and moral values the death the, the death value will remain paramount and when fitted with the political framework of kadocracy this value alone makes world conflict all but a certainty now thankfully he was wrong there was no trading of atomic bombs but uh he is correct in that if this this insane uh lunatic uh cult continues to drive us to oblivion such a fate might be ours well absolutely i you know that's actually been something that's haunted me for for years i remember you suggested that i watch that movie when the wind blows and i'll never forgive you for that <laughs> that was the saddest movie i'd ever <laughs> seen and i just remember being just so incensed at this prospect because we did come close several times to nuclear annihilation. I mean, anybody who lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis can tell you that. That almost happened. We were on the edge of global destruction. And I guess what I'd like to, to discuss, especially when we're talking about, like, what's the ultimate endgame of technology? What's the ultimate endgame of, of, of scientism? I, well, I mean, it really looks like these people are seeking uh, several things. One is immortality. They want to live forever. One is absolute power. The other is total knowledge. I mean, in other words, these people want to become as God. It's, it, 
this isn't speculation. We've seen this before. The, the, the advancement of medical technology, what's it for? Prolonging life? Well, for how long? What, at what point is, is it a moral question about how long we should remain alive? Or wh why this absolute pursuit of a so-called theory of everything? Well, it's to understand and know everything. What's, what about this development of the surveillance state and the complete integration of the internet with the surveillance state and that of corporations? Well, if not for total knowledge of, uh, of human activity, what is the development of ever more advanced and terrifying weapon systems, if not to acquire more control over our fellow man. So when we, I guess what I would say is the, the subconscious or perhaps even conscious end game is the creation of a technocratic elite that functions as God over this planet. Well, you see, Brock, that's interesting. You asked what is the goal of the, sci the scientism well, again, to quote from Fuller from the same page, this is a suicidal death cult. And what could all this striving to destroy lead to? To a veritable religion of death, in which the scientist becomes the immolating high priest and humanity the sacrificial victim. Exactly. The very idea that you would ask the question, should, how far should we allow the scientific process to go? Should we stop it? Should we delay it? Should we control it? is off the table. It is completely off the table. Bioethics is a joke. All it is is a rubber stamp on whatever the scientific elites want us to do. And the, 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 the actual fact is that the, the great danger of our age is not corporations. It is not governments. The great danger of our age is the scientific elite and the power that it wields, the power that it confers on governments, on corporations. But the fact is, it's they that have the power. The government needs them to run the drones. The corporations need them to run the computers. They're the ones that actually have the power, and they're the actual ones that are seeking our own destruction. Now, to shift gears a little bit, one of the most prescient uh, critiques of modern science, though unfortunately it was at the hands of a man who was a terrorist, was the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski. His manifesto outlines the grave threat and risk of the scientific dictatorship. He argues that man seeks meaningful work, work that's, that gives him meaning and value. And of course, such work is now often shunted to the side in the name of make work for the fact of you know corporate cubicles. And that leads to, of course, angst and dysfunction and people end up act, uh, acting that out in ways that are socially destructive. And he argues that from that what we get is the idea that, okay, science is actually controlling us. It's limiting what we can do. We can't live without it. For instance, when a car was introduced, people would say, well, you don't have to use a car. You can still walk and use a train and ride a horse. You don't have to have a car. But today, horses are gone. Walking is extremely impractical except for cities. Well, trains are almost gone at least in the United States, you cannot live without a car. When the computer, personal computer was introduced, I think it was probably the late 80s, early 90s, well, you didn't have to have a personal computer. You could live without one. And that was, but again, now you cannot live without a personal computer. And so technology makes us dependent upon the provider of the technology. And the more centralized that technical production is, the more, first of all, the more brittle and potentially likely it is to collapse. And if it does, we're all screwed. But furthermore, the, the people that have control over us, for instance, are, the people that run Microsoft have far more control over us than Genghis Khan had over his own people. People can live without Genghis Khan. We can't live without Microsoft. Oh, absolutely. That, 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 that actually, whenever I thought about that, that actually kind of haunted me because it's a slavery we sort of signed up for. It's a slavery that we volunteered for, and it's a slavery and a servitude that we love. And this actually creates a genuine power dynamic between those who produce and create technology and those who consume it. Uh, this, this does create genuine problems for society. 
And among those is a shift of the power structure. So you, I think you're right to say that, you know, corporations per se aren't necessarily going to be the enemy. The state per se isn't going to be the enemy. It's the relationship between those who produce and create technology and those who put forward the scientific uh, political paradigm that are going to be the greatest threat. I think you remember uh, John Holdren. I think most of us need to look him up again in case we forgot because he was Obama's science czar. And it, if you don't remember, it took Alex Jones purchasing his book, Ecoscience, and I think it was, what was it published back in the 70s? It, yeah. Right? Okay. So Alex Jones purchases this book and does an expose on John Holdren. And John Holdren loses his job. But what, what was it talking about? Well, uh, he was actually laying out the scientific plan for totalitarian management of the human race. In fact, I have a few quotes here. So this was this one was kind of uh, great. It was on page 786. It's quite a book. It says a program of sterilizing women after their second or third child, despite the relatively greater difficulty of the operation than vasectomy, might be easier to implement than trying to sterilize men. The development of a long-term sterilizing capsule that could be implanted under the skin and removed when pregnancy is desired opens additional possibilities for coercive fertility control. The capsule could be implanted at puberty and might be removable with official permission, <laughs> official permission for a limited number of births. And this is just one of the very few instances of the scientific elite attempting to resolve the problems that they have created. Because once you abolish morality, what is left between man other than power relations? In other words, it's not going to be a question of, you know, it's, it's bad to have too many children. It's you can't have too many children because we're going to make it so you can't. Well, exactly, exactly. And, and this gets to the point, uh, the, the crux of the Unabomber Manifesto is paragraph 174. And I'm going to read a recapitulation of it in Bill Joy's 2000. Uh, Wired article, Why the Future Doesn't Need Us. On the other hand, it is possible that human control over the machines may be retained. In that case, the average man may have control over certain private machines of his own, such as his car, his personal computer. But control over large systems of machines will be in the hands of a tiny elite, just as it is today, but with two differences. Due to improved techniques, the elite will have greater control over the masses. And because human work will no longer be necessary, the masses will be superfluous, a useless burden on the system. If the elite is ruthless, they may simply decide to exterminate the mass of humanity. Uh, if they are humane, they might use propaganda or other psychological or biological techniques to reduce the birth rate until the mass of humanity becomes extinct, leaving the world to the elite. Or if the elite consists of soft-hearted liberals, they may decide to play the role of good shepherds to the rest of the human race. They will see to it that everyone's physical needs are satisfied, that all children are raised under psychologically hygienic conditions, that everyone has a wholesome hobby to keep him busy, and that anyone who may become dissatisfied undergoes treatment to cure his problem. Of course, life will be so purposeless that people will have to be biologically or physiologically engineered either to remove the need for their power process. Uh, for Kaczynski, the power process is the seeking for meaningful work or make them supplement their drive for power into some harmless hobby. These engineered human beings may be happy in such a society, but they will certainly not be free. They will have been reduced to the status of domestic animals. Now, switching to Bill Joy, in the book, you don't discover until you turn the page that the author is Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Now, the book Bill Joy is speaking of is The Age of Spiritual Machines, published in 1999 and written by Ray Kurzweil. Now, back to Joy. I have no apologies for Kaczynski. His bombs killed three people during a 17-year terror campaign and wounded many others. Uh, Kaczynski's dystopian vision, unintended consequences, a well-known problem with the design and use of technology, and one that is clearly related to Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Our overuse of antibiotics has led to what may be the biggest problem so far, the emergence of antibiotic-resistant and much more dangerous bacteria. And then uh, skipping down a little bit, uh, the, cause may, the cause of many such surprises seems clear. The systems involved are complex 
involving interaction among and feedback between many parts. Any changes such a system will cascade in ways that are different to predict, difficult to predict. This is especially true when human actions are involved. Now, the key thing that also Kaczynski points out is once we're so dependent upon machines, we cannot unplug the machine without killing ourselves. Exactly. It's mutually assured destruction at that point. Because if we need the machine, in fact, uh, there was a, uh, an, uh, an evolutionary, uh, an evolutionary uh, um, popularizer who wrote speculative works of future evolution. His name was Dougal Dixon. And he wrote a book called Man After Man. And in Man After Man, there was a race of humans that lived in machines. And they couldn't live outside the machines. And if they left the machines, they would die. Um, which I find is a little hilarious. But here's the thing that I find so incredible about the Unabomber Manifesto, is that the scientific dictatorship that he describes, that, the, that Ted Kaczynski describes, whether he read H.G. Wells or Bernard Russell or Julian or Aldous Huxley, I do not know. But he predicted exactly the rise of the scientific dictatorship. Scientific dictatorship was... The prophets of the scientific dictatorship were people like Aldous Huxley in his Brave New World, people like um, H.G. Wells and his Open Conspiracy, and also even the Time Machine. Because in the Time Machine, there was a chapter called The Great Age of Science, where he goes into the future where there's a scientific dictatorship and is created a utopia. And then we also have Bertrand Russell in his twin works, the scientific outlook and the impact of science upon society. And all of those works, they argue for just these things. Bio biochemical control over the population. In fact, um, Aldous Huxley was interviewed by Mike Wallace, and he said that people would be made happy with drugs when they otherwise would not be happy. And that's the whole point of Brave New World. The idea that we have a scientific elite that treats us as guinea pigs for their own sick fetish pleasure of making man in their own image based on, you know, the bogus tabula rasa is, in fact, what is happening. That has been the plan for the past 100 years. And the fact that Kaczynski points it out so clearly and concisely, with, to my knowledge, having not even read them, maybe he has, maybe he hasn't, but I don't know that he has, is really incredible. And it's this scientific elite and dictatorship that is the true danger of the 21st century, not states or corporations. Well, C.S. Lewis, you know, would have called that the, the, the ultimate end goal of scientism to be the abolition of man. Because once we once you remove all the fundamental features of man and, and, and these individuals who are promoting this agenda clearly just want to remove man's rationality or his curiosity about his existence. Or, in other words, just completely abolish his purpose in life. But for C.S. Lewis, our purpose in life is who we are. And once you destroy that, once you replace it by hobbies and drugs, or any time we experience genuine emotions, we have to go seek therapy. This is, this is the abolition of man. That's what it is. There is no way around it, because that's, man is the problem for the scientific uh, Popularizers. Man is the problem. Once you get down to it, it's man's free will that they hate. It's man's free will that prevents them from being totally in control. So how do we abolish it? Well, just as Aldous Huxley said, you condition children uh, genetically and psychologically from birth until they're adults. You destroy the family unit. You destroy any concept of sexual mores. And the end game develops a, a for Huxley an international super state. And which is ironic because his older brother, Julian Huxley, became the first chairman of the United Nations Education, Science and Cultural Organization, also called UNESCO. In a in like in the uh, in a paper concerning UNESCO, I believe it was called UNESCO: Its Purpose and Philosophy. Yeah, you're right. Julian echoes a lot of his brother's thinking on this, and Julian says that the goal of UNESCO should be to render the people of Earth more amicable to the idea of international government. 
and to downplay or reduce cultural distinctions. And how does one go about this? Well, interestingly enough, the, well, there's one vehicle that seems to do the best job at this, better than socialism, and that's capitalism. Capitalism has a knack for homogenizing cultures. Well, that's and exactly why in um, A Brave New World, everybody's a hyper-consumerist. Well, exactly. I mean, it, basically, it was just a play, play on John Maynard Keene's uh, general theory. Uh, because in order to create, in other words, the general theory, you know, if for Aldous Huxley, who wrote this before uh, the general theory was even written, I believe. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But the idea was that, number one, actual real scientific advancement was bad for society to some extent, insofar as it was disruptive of the creation of a static society. And number two, in order to create and sustain a working environment, one must design things to fail. In other words, planned obsolescence is essential. It is key to the stability of society. So even the economic theory that's built into the idea of a global technocratic superstate is meaningless. There's no purpose to the economy. There's no, I remember in Brave New World, uh, they would they would play obstacle golf and the reason it was called obstacle golf was because it involved a tremendous amount of work to build the obstacle golf course and it required a tremendous amount of materials why because well that that was wasteful expenditure but wasteful expenditure that could create stability in society so the whole system is wrought with meaninglessness nothing has meaning and that's the great irony because it, at a conscious level, they think there's sort of meaning within science. But in practice, there is no meaning. All you have to do is take a step back and look at what they're doing to see how meaningless it is, how meaningless everything they're doing is. Everything's just, everything's there to be destroyed and wasted. Well, exactly. To really just kind of highlight the insanity of, the, of these technocratic elites, when Neil deGrasse Tyson interviewed Ray Kurzweil, uh, and he asked him, what about the dangers, the potential pitfalls of science? And Ray Kurzweil said that 100 million people died in the 20th century as a result of the development of technology. And he said rather glibly, I think it's worth it. Uh, you know, Janet Reno, uh, you know, ghosts might be coming to mind at the moment right now. But uh, <laughs> the idea that <laughs> it was worth it. A hundred. See, that's the insanity of these lunatics. How many people have to die before we say enough is enough? Is it when we can get killed by poison gas and machine guns? Is it when we can destroy all life on Earth with NBC, nuclear, biological, chemical weapons? Is it when we have self-replicating nanobots that become the von Neumann gray goo? I mean, what is the point in which we say enough is enough? We just need to stop before we're all killed. Right. Well, what's the point of preserving humanity at all if we are, if, if in the end we abolish it? What, 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 what purpose does the perpetuation of the race even serve? Well, not at all. In fact, many of these people uh, are, are gloved about the age of thinking machines where humans will become obsolete and either we'll become machines ourselves or die out. We'll give birth to the quote, you know, the next stage of human evolution. That's the way these people view it as these thinking machines. And that would be a terrible, terrible thing because if that was the case, let's just let's just uh, um, you know uh, entertain the idea that there is a further stage in human development. Something I I deny, but let's entertain that notion. So, what governs our relationship to? the animals we consider inferior well it's the fact that they're inferior and that's why we can eat them <laughs> that's why we can have controlled kill-offs that in other words our sort of the justification for our domination over them is a sort of evolutionary superiority but if if the scientific project ends in a sort of division of the human race between the inferior human race and the next step in the evolution of the human race what has been won 
because in other words now this now because there's a there's a a race of beings that are a step higher in the evolutionary chain than human beings suddenly now human beings are just another animal that can be killed controlled or consumed well exactly exactly um, there's and, no purpose and, and, to it there's no reason we need to we there's no reason we need to go that that far but there's there is no end there is no there's no way to say science stops here and goes no further and because of that it, it must necessarily end in the abolition of man well exactly exactly i mean for instance one of short of the thinking machines and we might be able to get into that later uh two two um possibilities that are being pushed are flying cars and nanobots. Ray Kurzweil is very keen on nanobots. Now, you see, one of the things that is patently obvious to anybody that thinks about nanobots for 30 minutes, 30 seconds even, is this. If everybody's required to have nanobots implanted in them for the, quote, health reasons, it's to improve your health. Well, here's what I think any rational person would do. They would make nanobots out of biodegradable material, and they would build a self-destruct mechanism into the nanobot. Now, let's say you have nanobots flowing all throughout your brain to increase your mental faculties, blah, 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 and key arteries to improve blood flow and remove clots. <coughs> and then this corporation that is producing nanobots gets unwanted and unfavorable reporting from a certain reporter. But that reporter, of course, at birth, was already implanted with nanobots, and they feel like, oh, we don't like what he's saying. We're going to have one of these nanobots explode in his brain, causing an aneurysm that will cause him to bleed out. And when the autopsy shows up, well, he died of an aneurysm. And there's no way to know that, oh, oops, well, I, I guess he, uh, <laughs> he didn't do that. Uh, the other thing is if you have flying cars, and they claim they're going to be fly flown automatically. Well, if that's the case, again, in the same situation of unfavorable press coverage, uh, the guy flying the car, much like people fly drones today, you have a guy in a cubicle that has a remote control that flies the drone, he'll be flying the car. Or the computer operator who operates the server, he can get a hint from the higher-ups, hey, how the malfunction happen when this car crashes and the guy has an unfortunate accident? And now the reporter's dead and, oh, I'm sorry, it was just a malfunction. There's, you know, there's no way to know that it was actually caused... The corporation can kill you at will, even without the government, and nobody would know the difference. This kind of this kind of power is insane, and a private individual, let alone a government, can kill you at will. You think Obama's drone strikes are scary? Imagine the provider of nanobots or flying cars and what they could do. That is a terrifying notion because, uh, you know, I thought I think you know. There's a lot of there's a lot of danger to this because there's 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 two problems and there's two different things that that are involved. There's the there's the stratification of power, but an overall shift upwards in the individual's power. It's ironic, but I mean, imagine that there's a power structure. You have your elite at the top, and on your y-axis, you sort of have the the amount of power. Well, what what technology has done is actually shifted the whole structure upwards. So yeah, the top still remain the top, but the bottom actually acquires new forms of power and thus new form new ways to be dangerous. And that's why I think we're seeing an increase in uh, mass murder i think we're seeing an increase in uh cyber terror we're seeing an, an increase in uh, corporate involvement overseas when the execution of their power over uh governments which are actually weaker i mean when you look at walmart i mean they're 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 not their uh uh revenue annual revenue is greater than that of some countries so they acquire a, a, an astonishing amount of power in the process. It's a, it's a I, I, you could see, say it, uh, it's a kind of entropy that's being introduced into the system and things of necessity become more chaotic. But ironically, as you know, when things become more chaotic, uh, it increases government control. I think it was Friedrich Nietzsche who said, never did the monarchs of Europe sit so securely on their thrones than, to, than when the anarchists began throwing bombs at them. Chaos 
all then serves as the sort of uh, conduit for an increase in uh, the power of, of states. So technology distributes power and it also increases the power at the top at the same time. Well, you see, exactly. Well, uh, Nietzsche also said that the 20th century would be the bloodiest century in human history precisely because they were not, as secular atheists, they were not willing to give up Christian morality. They still felt the need to justify their Christian morality, which they could no longer hold to. But the other thing is that, well, actually, we need to be wrapping this up now, and so we will conclude in part two. Part two, we will discuss the philosophical uh, difficulties in the assumptions of scientism, uh, such as philosophical naturalism, such as the main brain, the main, the mind brain identity, such as identity with the body, and other issues, as well as the solution to such a problem. So we'll have to wait till part two. So bye bye. Hey.